fun is all about change It's all inclusive Every day of the week When the world comes together United as one Sharing stories Through the eyes of Hillview TV Hey, good evening everyone Welcome to What Matters We are Jojo and Jess and we are so excited to have you tuning in tonight to um, celebrate our second episode. Um, and I just wanted to say a quick thank you to everyone that tuned in last week. Uh, we had a huge first show. Thank you to everyone that shared it. Um, so I'm so excited. We've got an amazing guest coming up tonight. But before we do get started, uh, I would really like to start by acknowledging the traditional landowners of, you know, of where we gather and, and, and pay your respect to our elders past present and emerging of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nations. Yes, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to our beautiful um, our beautiful land, our beautiful um, um, culture that we are going to bring on tonight, our um, yeah. Aboriginal culture. We have a beautiful friend, Mandanara Bales, who is going to be with us, and she's got plenty of knowledge. And I know from my own personal experience, um, as my, um, my Māori heritage and my Māori background um, from New Zealand that I myself have wanted to learn so much about our Aboriginal um, yeah. culture here in Australia yeah. and tonight we actually have the privilege of that happening. Abs absolutely and I guess you know even in terms of just talking about an acknowledgement and why it's so important um, of why we do it. You know, it's a diplomatic tradition that has been done for tens and thousands of years um, by mm. our Aboriginal people. And I think, you know, as visitors to this land, it's so important that we acknowledge these traditions. Um, we acknowledge yeah. the teachings uh, and we carry on and we pay respect um, to the elders. So I really invite you all to participate in the oldest living culture that we have here in Australia, in our own backyard. And, and I'm so honoured, yeah, like I said, to have Mandanara on. So before we do bring her on, guys, I just want to remind you that we are streaming live from Indie TV, uh, from Ovo Play, and we are streaming live to Facebook and to YouTube. Yes. So if you are tuning in for the next half hour, or maybe we'll go over, um, please share this live stream, yes. uh, create a little watch party, and, um, and, and, and let your friends know that you're tuning in. Uh, now, so um, we can get this message out as well. Yes, thank you. Um, also, um, if you want, you can leave your comments and questions um, in the comments uh, section below on the What's Matters page because what will happen throughout the show is we're going to bring them up on the screen here um, and um, share them with our viewers. Yes, absolutely. So I guess without further ado, I reckon we're going to start by bringing on our guests. And before we do, I'd love to give Mandanara... Um, a welcome because Mandanara, she's someone that I've known for a really long time. She's the co-founder and managing director of The Black Card, who she's going to talk more about. And she's also the host and, and, uh, and founder of the Black Magic Woman podcast. She's doing amazing things in the corporate space uh, and, and really carrying on the traditions. Um, and I guess, you know, her family have been part of the Aboriginal movement since the 60s and 70s. So... Uh, she's, you know, really had a, has a huge, huge influence, um, not only within, you know, the corporate space, but I guess is really a voice um, for our Aboriginal community. Um, so I guess, yeah, without further ado, let's bring on Mandanara so we can get this show started. Hi, my name is Mandanara Bales. I'm going to introduce myself following Aboriginal terms of reference which is an ancient tradition that goes back tens of thousands of years in this country. So my name is Mandanara. I'm a Wanarua Bunjalung woman on my mother's side. Wanarua people come from the Hunter Valley of New South Wales and Bunjalung people up towards Ballina, Byron Bay, the Tweed Heads region on the border of New South Wales and Queensland. And my father's side, I'm a Gungaloo Birigaba woman from central Queensland. I am one of eight daughters, I have no brothers. I grew up in Redfern, which is the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation in Sydney. So in terms of introducing myself in Aboriginal terms of reference, it's quite different to introducing yourself, say in Western terms of reference, which is all about what you do instead of who you are. So in Aboriginal society, I guess the focus on relationships goes back tens of thousands of years. And when you think about it, 
It was a society with over 750 different countries that spoke different languages and had different laws and had different dreaming stories. And yet nobody ever took over anybody's land. So this style of introduction or the focus on relationships is like a security guarantee when you think about it. It's also about minimizing the potential for conflict by getting to know each other builds trust and we can then obviously get to know each other on a deeper level instead of hi my name is Mandanara Bales I'm the managing director of Black Card like that doesn't say much about me does it like I'm a mother I'm an auntie I'm a sister get ready guys I'm much more I'm a wife I'm much more than my job title Oh, oh wow that's so amazing beautiful opening welcome Mandanara we're so excited to have you here thank you so much for joining us thank you Jojo and Jess and um, each time I watch myself I'm like oh my god was that me and I had long hair and it was darker um, but look it's an absolute you know it's a privilege and also an honor to be part of your show Jojo and we do go way back so you know, back to the to the old days, the good old days before I became a mum. And I just want to say as well that um, you know your acknowledgement was beautiful, um, and and to actually try and, and educate the wider population on something that is so visible today. You know, everybody in this country, you see it on your documentaries, you see it on websites, um, at different events. But I don't think people understand the why. So before I carry out uh, you know, our diplomatic tradition, which is acknowledging that I'm on Yagara country, which is south of the Marawa River, and the Marawa River um, was obviously renamed as the Brisbane River after Governor Brisbane. So the Marawa River is the, the, I guess, the border between the Turrbal to the north and the, and the Yagara to the south. So... Um, I want to acknowledge their, their elders, past and present, and I've had the absolute privilege of uh, living here, working here, and raising my children here. So thank you. Aww. And you know what? Thank you because we go back a long, long time. And when we reconnected, was it 2014? When you and we will get into the black card. Um, and I remember coming along, and uh, it was the first time I'd actually ever seen or heard of an acknowledgement and seen it done. And even now, I get really emotional because I was, you know, 34, maybe 24, 34 at the time. And it really it hit home for me, Mandanara, because it really showed me how that I had very little knowledge um, of the traditions, of the culture, of, of, of our Aboriginal community. And to be able to be there and, and, and be amongst you and be amongst your elders and be part of the black card too, to learn that from the elders was just a, a huge eye-opener. And, and, you know, now, you know, I, I will do what I can to carry on the tradition. So thank you for, for acknowledging um, that and thank you for all that you do. But um, look, you know, I I um I'm so excited because I know you've um you come from a family, Mandanara, of mm. um, elders who um your your mum, your dad, all of them have been you know part of the Aboriginal movement since, since the sixties and seventies. Um, and I want to know, you know, what was it like uh, for you growing up as an Aboriginal woman, as an Aboriginal girl back then, being part of that movement? Can you please give us a bit of a you know of of, of what it was for Mandanara? Back in those days. All righty. So it's in Redfern, which is the lake ball. Your people are one of 29 tribes of Sydney and months of the first fleet arriving. Nine were wiped out in the first 12 months. So, in terms of growing up in Redfern, I didn't say this. I am the first generation on my mother's side that's been removed under government policy of the day. Now that's not that long ago. So when we when we when we look at history in this country, we're talking about living memory. People are still alive that carry these still that trauma. So I go back five generations to Redfern, also known as the block. So Redfern's very, you know, near and dear to me and, and we'll always have a special place in my, my heart. Guess what? Redfern. Redfern was like the heart of the 
civil rights movement in Australia. Yeah. That, in 19, I remember just in 19, the, 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 the year of the bicentennial, 200 years since our country was invaded. So it was the first time that tens of thousands of Aboriginal people from right across the country all went to Sydney, to Redfern, and it was the largest gathering of Aboriginal people in our whole history. We're going back, you know, there's archaeological evidence that dates us back in this country at least 140,000 years. But we had never had to come together like that, right? We're autonomous peoples, we're from different countries, we spoke different languages. We may have spoke languages of our neighbours, maybe up to 30 different languages, so linguists are quite blown away. But after those kind of close neighbours or close language groups, you didn't go beyond those language groups. So I remember the first protest in 1988. I, I remember it vividly. I was five years old. And my dad was at the front. He was the one with the microphone, right? So that, that March, I remember seeing um, a, a, like a, a replica of the Endeavour sailing down, you know, the, the Sydney Harbour. And I was like, I, I've learned, I've learned about this this ship, the Endeavour, at school. You know, in, in, by five years old, I already knew that that was Captain James Cook and the Endeavour because I I learnt that at school. But what a slap in the face for people to stand there with their Aussie flags and celebrate the day that our country was invaded. For me, as a five-year-old kid, I still remember how how angry my family was and how angry our community was and I saw a lot of the old people crying and it was like they were crying because you know what our ancestors went through what they suffered what they endured so yeah 1988 the first big protest that I remember as a five-year-old kid gathering at Redfern Oval or Redfern Park where the Rabbitohs train today go to the South Sydney Rabbitohs um but a lot of the conversations happened around my kitchen table growing up. A lot of the conversations happened uh, at Cope Street in Redfern, which is where Radio Redfern was. So my dad would be on the radio, my grandmother would be on the radio, and that, that was the opportunity for them to tell everybody, hey, there's a protest happening, all you mob, you know, from Brisbane, from Darwin, from Perth, wherever you're, you know, you're tuning in, you just need to get to Sydney. So... It was the power of media, right? And my family have been in media since the 70s. It's the power of, of community radio that was able to get the message out to our mob to all get to Sydney and really come together as one mob. You know, the only time we've ever really united, right, is under the red, black and yellow flag. Before the red, black and yellow flag was, was designed or invented, um, we never had to unite. You know, actually, unification was not seen as a good thing. But, yes, yeah, sitting around the kitchen table and, and really key influential people coming into our house, talking to my grandmother and to my dad about what their next move was, you know, thinking about strategy, thinking about tactics, where the next protest was going to be. You, you, you look back now like, wow, they are in our household. Like I remember these people and a lot of them are not with us today. So it was a privilege to grow up in a very politically active family and a politically active community and um, I would not be a citizen in my own country and I wouldn't have the opportunities that I have if my grandmother and her brothers and sisters didn't get in the car and drive to Sydney and then go to Canberra and, and fight for Aboriginal people to be recognised as, as human beings in their own country. And I'm talking about human beings because, as you mentioned in one of your posts, Jojo, we was basically not just treated like, but we were considered, you know, flora and fauna. So, you know, we weren't counted with the with the, the cattle and the sheep and we weren't counted with the, the, the human population. It was flora and fauna. So if that's where we were counted, then how do you think we were treated? And it's only been about 50 years, just over 50 years, that Aboriginal people have been recognised as citizens in our own country. So, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and that, is, that is heartbreaking, um, 
you know, when I heard about that, that, you know, for, and that was up until the referendum in 1967. That's when um, you guys, you know, then were part of you know, the constitution and, and no longer considered fauna fauna. That's disgusting. And Australia has a really long rooted, dark history. Uh, and, and you mentioned before about all the different, you know, hundreds of different of languages um, and, and countries that existed. And we do mm. have the map of, um, of Australia, of all the different countries. Um, and I'd love to bring that up. And, and I'd love for you to talk even a little bit further about that. Because I know a lot of people unaware of this map, unaware of, you know, the, the existence that you had. And you guys have, you know, have been the guardians of this land, like you said, for 140 thousand years and more uh, but we, and yeah, let's bring that's that. what's important i said and we didn't invade our neighbors you know like that yeah. when you look at the map let's let's let's, let's get into this <laughs> yeah i know let's bring that map up wow wow look at that yeah. so you're this is the all right, this is the Horton version of the Norman Tyndale map. And Tyndale, back in the 30s, he was an anthropologist and also an ethnographer from South Australia. In the 1930s, it took him about 30 years to actually put this map together. But one of the obje one, of, one of his motivations behind this piece of work, and, and we're looking at it today, was that we were seen as it was nearly extinct in the 1930s, not the 1830s. But they, it, there was nearly complete genocide in this country, which means basically we were nearly all wiped off the face of the planet. We were lucky to survive the invasion and onslaught in this country. So this map that we're looking at, it's not 100% accurate, but what it says to me, you know, it's the principle of this map, is that every square inch of this country was occupied every square inch of this country was somebody's obligation and responsibility to look after that country. All of those different colors on that map represents a different language group. And within those language groups, there was many dialects of that language. They're all autonomous countries, each had their own laws. And when I talk about law, I'm talking about capital L-A-W, people think we're uncivilized um, and primitive, you know, hunters and gatherers and, um, wandering around naked, looking for a, a feed and occasionally painting on a cave and maybe having a fight. But we weren't nomads. We, we did not wander around the landscape. There, there was law, multiple laws, not just one law across the country. Capital LAW refers to how you socially and politically order your society. So each of those countries had their own languages, had their own laws and had their own dreaming stories. And those dreaming stories are like, instead of one genesis across the country, just imagine hundreds of genesis, you know, in terms of stories around evolution or stories around creation, you know, a creative narrative of, of, of how everything came to be that's in that one place. So... All of the different languages, all the different laws, capital L-A-W, not L-O-R-E. When you talk about or hear the word L-O-R-E, it's very different to L-A-W. So, you know, I just want to let people know that um, every Aboriginal person that grew up in this country grew up in the law. They knew what the law was and they knew what their punishment would be if they broke the law. So it was like a conscious decision to break the law because you knew what your punishment was going to be. So you were your own law carrier. This is a society with, well, this is an island continent with hundreds of societies, small societies that did not have a need for armies, did not have a need for police and, and prisons. This is an example that you may not come across anywhere in the world where People did not inv invade their neighbours. That's what's so important. When you look at this map, let me say this. If there was constant invading, which means people are taking over other countries, you know, conquering, subjugating, um, invading, colonising, then there would be fewer languages that would have survived all of those invasions. So look at Europe and all the different countries around Europe. 
you know the history of those countries because of the languages that languages that they speak not just in europe but around the world so the language i'm speaking is english right because right? the english invaded this country so if there was invasions that were part of our culture or our history then this map would look very different so even though this map you know was done by a white fella uh, and a, an anthropologist it's not 100 percent accurate because he did not always engage with aboriginal people to find out what that country was and who it belonged to and where the border ended so a lot of aboriginal people are still my country is not there my language group is not there so this is just for, for me i like to use this map as an educational like resource so it gives people an, a, a really good not an idea but an insight that no we're not one people i'm not a representation of nearly a million different aboriginal people that you know spread right across this country i'm one aboriginal person and i'm sharing my own views and perspectives and and what my elders and my family have taught me. When we look at the map, it's the principle of the map that every square inch of this country was occupied. Not one bit of vacant land, rubbish land, wasteland. Every square inch of this country was occupied. Wow. That is amazing. And I'm, and I'm so sorry to, to hear of, you know, all of that, look, I'm not gonna lie, that land been confiscated the colonizers came in they took what wasn't theirs and because your people are so humble in my eyes i see our aboriginal people as the most beautiful yeah. humble culture they could be um they were dehumanized they were colonized by this oh i don't know what the word is but you know when you just said um in terms of us being really humble i you know what i think people don't understand that we are probably the only indigenous group in the world, and there's half a billion on the planet, we're probably the only indigenous group in the world that didn't invent a hierarchy, right? A structure like this where usually a chieftainship structure, there's a chief and then all the rest of the tribe underneath, which is a very male dominant society, right? And I don't think I've come across female chiefs before. I could be wrong, right? But in our country, we had a flat a lateral structure of governance where male and female complemented each other. One would never dominate the other. And elders sat above the male and females, the group. Elders just sat, sat above us. But elders had authority. You know, the power, in the Western word, authority and power sits together, right? It's conflated with aboriginal society we separated it authority sits with older people elders and power is diffused throughout the group and the elders are part of that group so instead of having a chieftainship structure and one person at the top and people underneath we didn't have that system in, in this country so we did not develop a warrior culture like the maori in aotearoa we did not develop a warrior culture, but it doesn't mean that we never had warriors, right? There's Jandamara, there's Pemaway, um, there's Dundali. There's, there's a lot of Aboriginal warriors. But when people go, a lot of the time people say to me, but why didn't you fight back like the Maldi? And why didn't you do this like the Native Americans? I said, hold a minute. They all had chieftainship structures and a lot of those other indigenous groups went to war with other groups. We had never went to war with any of our neighbors in our whole history of living in this country. So that would tell you about our society. So no monarchies, no kings, no queens, no gods, you know, no prime ministers, no chiefs, um, and men were not. Male and female, run this country together as equal partners that's what people need to understand man our men and our women you know our women are autonomous women um, our women are aut autonomous in, in saying that our women are bosses for themselves <laughs> so that's that society you know where women and, and male and female 
sit by, sit side by side there's there's no competition we didn't have any issues around equality so women could get on with their lives and you know reach their full potential because they're not trying to compete to try and be up there with men so what we developed in this country was a non-competitive society a non-judgmental society and a non-ego based society it's very different to what was imposed on us and what is still imposed on us today when you have a look at western society it's highly competitive highly judgmental it's a highly individualistic society where I come from a group-based society. I'm part of a collective, right? But I find my individuality within my group. There's a lot of conflict between the two worlds, the Western world and the Aboriginal world. And you don't grow up and your parents are telling you all about how you're going to navigate the Western world, which is when you go to school. Man, you got to work that out on your own. So in terms of being resilient, man, from, from the day you leave the house, preschool or prep, you're kind of on your own. And that was the hardest thing growing up in this country is going to 14 different schools and never ever feeling like you belong. like the way in terms of where you you know you uh, work amongst each other there's that there's no hierarchy the way in which you you know been able to look after this land for so long um, but look I'm keeping my eye on the time Mandana, I know you're doing a lot at the moment you're sitting on the committee with the, the stop black deaths in custody I know since the Royal Commission in 90 um, in the 90s there's been you know 437 deaths um, and it really just it shows that there is no justice in the justice system. We've got, you know we've had the whole Black Lives, you know Matter movement, which you know there's different views on that as well. But I guess you know we're in Australia. Um, obviously, Aboriginal First Nations lives matter. Can you tell us more about you know your role on the committee, um, what you're doing, where it's going, and I guess how we can all be a part of it, and how we can all support one way or another. You know what, Jojo, it's good that you pointed out there's two different movements, right? There's a Black Lives Matter and, and George Floyd and, you know, may he rest in peace. And then you've got the Aboriginal deaths in custody in the Australian context. And like you said, in 1991, we had a Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody. And from 1980 to 1989, there was 99 Aboriginal deaths in custody. Those 99 deaths formed the royal inquiry into Aboriginal deaths in custody but 99 deaths in nine years since 1991 there's been over 330 i think there's 337 recommendations um from that inquiry and we can count on one hand how many of those have actually been implemented and since 1991 until 2020, we don't actually know the amount of deaths in custody, Judge, but we, we've got a bit of an estimate, at least 440. So 440 since 1991 plus the 99 from 1980 to 1989. You could basically say, you know, just under 600 Aboriginal deaths in custody since 1980. What about before 1980? Was that unaccounted so, for? Well, you know what? You could literally get away with murder. Mm. Yeah. And, 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 and that's what has happened. Mm -hmm. that our government have gotten away with mm. murder. There's genocide. so much blood. There's been genocide. There's been the massacres that have taken place. Uh, and it's been like, it's been so... Um, really, um, really sad, embarrassing, and just shameful and disgusting mm. um, that there's still no acknowledgement uh, for yeah. all, so all the terrible things that happened. Is that what the best thing is, is this, right? For the first time in in my living memory, and I'm only like, I think I'm 37. I've had a birthday recently. I can never remember my age. In my living memory, I have never seen so many people <laughs> stop laughing. <laughs> I've never seen so many people come out and support us, right? So obviously it started a bit of a, a movement, it's starting conversations and we're still talking about it, which is really good. 
But Jojo, the second protest we had in Brisbane, instead of the 50,000, we were lucky to have 2,000 people turn up, which is all good. You know, we'll still turn up because this is our this is our experience. This is our lives. These are our family members. When an Aboriginal person dies in custody, and we know that another Black family is grieving, we grieve with them. We may not even know them, but we have a story. Nearly every Aboriginal family in this country has a similar story and experience of losing someone in custody. Nearly every Aboriginal family can say, yeah, my auntie, my uncle, my sister, my brother, my husband's family, my uncle, my grandparents. And ab nearly every Aboriginal family has some kind of story around, you know, losing someone, whether it's in a police cell, like Tanya Day, whether it's in a prison van, like Mr Baker, whether it's in a police state, uh, a, um, a correctional facility, they're all still deaths in custody. And yet out of all of those deaths, not one conviction recorded, not one person has ever been held accountable. That's what we're trying to do now is we're trying to actually organise ourselves and be very um, strategic in saying to the governments of today, whether it's our local government, state government, federal government, we want the the recommendations, we want them implemented. Yeah. And we need everyday Australians to actually speak up and support us and demand that Aboriginal people, right, we get justice, those families get justice. David Dungay Jr. He also said, I can't breathe. You go and see the CCTV footage of David Dungay and, you know, I just want to really quickly acknowledge if his family is listening, I, I apologise for, for speaking his name after his past, but I know I've got permission. I I produced these placards, right, of, of at least 20 families so that when we got to the protest, we were humanising this movement. It's not about, you know, stop, de stop deaths in custody, Black Lives Matter. When you saw one of the faces, like Kenya Day, like Dumaji, like Walker from Yundamu, when you saw a face, I think that became much more real for people, that this was not just about, you know, turning up and singing out, you know, what do we want, what do we got, and doing all the chants. When you turn up to a protest, what you're doing is you're supporting these families that are waiting for their day in court. They're still waiting for justice for their loved ones. And to me, that's over 600 families that are still waiting for justice. That, that to me is not, it's, it's, it's embarrassing. And it's not just embarrassing, it's really sad, the disregard towards Aboriginal people's lives in this country. That's what hurts me because, you know what, I've got Aboriginal children. Yeah. They're trying yeah. to get their heads down, everything. My son, nine years old, microphone, says, Mum, you're going to go buy me a microphone. I need people to hear me. And I went and bought my nine-year-old. It just cost me about two grand. Man, we got the little buggy, put the, um, the, the PA system, and I just thought, man, my, my dad would be so proud. My little ones, you know, the fourth generation out there on the streets protesting. protesting. There's ways you know we what? can you go have about. Have you have there you go, Jess. Them. No, you have to teach them. Yeah. Because I tell you what, the fight is not over mm -hmm. and it's never going to be over with these Western systems in, in place. I'm telling you now, even my people back home, we're still fighting till today. Yeah. Even though we had a treaty, we're still fighting. Mm -hmm. We're still fighting for our rights. We're still fighting for our land. We're still fighting for to revive our culture. Yeah. You know, my grandparents, they weren't even allowed to speak our language, so therefore we lost it. Yeah. Our generation lost yeah. it because when they went to school, they would get a good bashing for it. So these oh. things, unfortunately, oh. we have to keep fighting for. Of course, yes, and you know what, it, it's, it's like the English learnt their lesson with their experience with your people. You know, they were like, well, we're not going to negotiate any agreement with them. <laughs> That's what I think. You know, we are the only English-speaking, commonwealth country in the world that still doesn't have an agreement with the first people. 
Yeah, and I, and I was gonna I was gonna ask you about that because it is 2020. There is no treaty in 2020, mm. Mandanara. You know, like no, and that is that again is so embarrassing. What, what do we do? You know, in terms of and and and, and looking at the map, but it's like you know we're, we're uh, there's all these hundreds of different of, of, of tribes of countries of different languages um, mm. and and you want to remain autonomous but how do we come together as one to have a career a, a treaty yeah and that's that's what's happening around the country right now the Queensland government has tracked the treaty the Victorian government has a treaty commissioner Annie Jill Gallagher in the Northern Territory there's a treaty commissioner so there are actually um, there, there is a movement, right? But this is the thing. If we, if we, if we do have a treaty, on whose terms of reference is that treaty going to be based on? You know, it, that's with the Maori, right? The English, you know, they knew exactly what they were doing in terms of, you know, if you couldn't reach an agreement, then it would go with the English, <laughs> and and I think that's what needs to be really thought out if we come together as equals right as equals it has to be on aboriginal terms of reference how we run this country we need to be in control of our own destinies we need to be sitting at the table when there are policies that are written that impact on our lives we need to be sitting there not some politician in canberra that's never been to an aboriginal community and will quite openly admit that they've never been to an aboriginal community yet they're in control of of writing you know policies that impact on our lives the stolen generations have never ended in terms of children being removed in this country aboriginal children it's 10 Aboriginal children to one. So you want to destroy a culture, just take the children. There was a policy in place that allowed government to take the children. My mum was taken because she had an Irish father. No other reason, but she had an Irish father. The stolen generations have not ended in this country. You only have to look at the statistics, right? We're the most incarcerated people on the planet. Females, Aboriginal women, are locked up at higher rates than Aboriginal men. Go figure. So if all of these Aboriginal women, since 1991, there's been a 246% increase of Aboriginal women in prison. And 80% of those women are mothers or carers of children. So all of these young people in our society that don't have their mothers, their aunties, their big sisters, and we are the backbone of our families. We're the backbone of our of our culture, of our society. You take the women around, take the women away from that, then who's going to raise the children? Yeah, absolutely. You know? So for me, it's absolutely heartbreaking to know that 250 years and not a lot has changed. And my dad no. fought to the day he died. My grandmother fought to the day she died. You know, I don't want to die young because of all the stress that you take on because it consumes every you know every cell in your body you know you have to try and switch off from a lot of it otherwise it literally it, it becomes so overwhelming that a lot of a lot of aboriginal people in terms of suicide our youth aboriginal youth are the highest in the world in terms of youth suicide aboriginal youth the leading contributing cause of death for Aboriginal people between the age of 15 and 35 is suicide. I've buried seven kids at the Aboriginal school here in Acacia Ridge, seven kids, all committed suicide in one school and not one child was newsworthy. Not wow. one child. Wow. You know, you know we need people like you. You know, you 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 can talk to your family and friends and people that that are in your networks and in your spaces and in your organisations, and you can challenge them, right? You can challenge them. I'm part of the three percent of the population. You make up the ninety-seven percent of the population. We need you guys to educate yourselves, and we need you to support us and 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 walk with us but have the confidence to just challenge people and go no no no, that shit ain't right 
don't stand there and let people talk absolute shit with no facts, but yet everyone is, you know, everyone's entitled to an opinion, but hey, at least be informed with your opinion yeah. and then we'll have a conversation. Yeah. So that's where it starts, yeah. Jojo. How do we come together? First of yeah. all, see me as a human being before you just see me as another Aboriginal person. You know, I'm a human yeah. being first and foremost. And um, I think that's, that's, that's the sad thing is we've been put in this box for far too long and we need to we need to break out of that box, you know. When I'm a businesswoman, I'm a wife, you know. I participate in many different, you know, community sports. I do volunteering, refereeing with my basketball, the kids' basketball. Like we we're part of society, right? We're contributing to society, mm. but you know, people um, don't. Yeah. Interesting enough, I had this conversation with my brother because he's he's been here um, since the beginning of the year and he teaches in a lot of the schools in our area. Mm. Um, and he said something to me that he was very disappointed with Australia because every class he's been into, the educational curriculum over here, does not acknowledge the Aboriginal culture. Mm. And he was quite disgusted in that. He, he was quite disgusted. And I was saddened by that because that is disappointing and that is true. How, how, how is anyone going to know or learn of these cultures, uh, this beautiful culture that you have to share with us yeah. when it's, the basics aren't even put in the curriculum itself? Yeah. Of course. Look, I just want to say to, you, to your brother, Black Card has, um, has a partnership with the Queensland Teachers Union. So now my sister today was delivering training to, to teachers across different schools in Cairns state schools. Last year we delivered about 25 workshops across Queensland for, for teachers and, and principals. But this is not Education Queensland. This is a union that came to us and said, how can we equip our members with the tools, with the knowledge, with the confidence to facilitate a discussion in the classroom when it comes to embedding Indigenous knowledge and perspectives in the curriculum? How do we arm our teachers with that knowledge to support that other perspective, right? So, we're, you know what, through the union, and I want to give a shout out to Queensland Teachers Union because if you want to be a highly accomplished teacher, which is a hat, there's a professional standards framework that teachers have to demonstrate that, that those standards. And there's two standards that relate specifically to engaging with Aboriginal uh, people and communities and engaging with Aboriginal learners or students. So our training now is, I would say, you know, for the first time, um, it's not strategically aligned to that framework, but it is the only face-to-face -face training that members of the Queensland Teachers Union have access to. So that's a big shift, that for the very first time that teachers in Queensland are getting access to some high level training that will give them the tools and the confidence to have these conversations um, and to also reach out and, and build relationships with the community and bring us into your school, support you in teaching those Indigenous knowledges and perspectives if you're not too sure where to start. You know, Black Card is only one organisation that's in this space. There's many um, organisations that are, are trying to do their thing in different states and territories. So if you're, you know, listening and, and watching this show, you can either reach out to Black Card um, or just Google, you know, cultural education and training in Victoria or cultural awareness providers in Sydney. Um, there's hundreds of people out there. But you know what? Why is it up to us in terms of the 3% of my population to educate the masses in this country? Each citizen in this country needs to take this on as their own responsibility to educate themselves and stop saying, oh, well, I didn't learn this at school and, or whatever your story is. Like, wake the hell up. Yeah. You know, and, and why, why are we going to leave our children trying to, you know, clean up this mess? I just want to, in terms of my, my lifetime, I just want to make sure that, I do enough that my children don't feel that they need to, you know, give up on, on their hopes and dreams because they're pulled back by, you know, the the injustices and the racism and the discrimination. I want my children 
to, to be engineers, to be astronauts, to be bankers or lawyers or doctors, not sitting here delivering freaking cultural awareness training in year 2030 yeah. or year 2035. Yeah. And, and, and look at, you know, I know we haven't really touched a lot on the black card, but, um, you know, I, I, I honour you for what you have what you do yeah. and, and you really are out there educating people and it's about how do we understand the culture as well and in terms of doing business too, you do a lot in that corporate space working with some you know you've got the the black magic uh, woman podcast so i've listened to your podcast and you're you know you're uh, uh talking to some of the biggest influential leaders in the country uh, and i know you know I, I spoke to you a little bit about that so there's obviously big things happening in that space yeah. i know we're gonna have to wrap up soon but um yeah how can people plug in listen yeah. tell us a little bit about that and then um yeah have some plugins before you take off yeah <laughs> okay, okay. So, you know linkedin is is the place to be for me i'm not really into twitter and instagram and everything else but you know follow black card it's our trading our, our legal name is australian black card even though we trade as black card um that's because i think american express owned black card so anyways follow us on linkedin either the business page black card or me as an individual and i share so much of everyone else's um you know successes their businesses their, their articles their experiences what their organizations are doing so if you follow me on linkedin you'll find that i share a lot of people's um I'm, I basically use my platform to give other people a voice. So I've taken that in terms of being on LinkedIn and just sharing everything. I started a podcast so that I could bring those voices to this platform in terms of another form of media to just get into the homes of, you know, as many people as we can to just celebrate how deadly our people are. Despite all of, all of what's happened to us, we still see the good in people. And that's what my grandmother yeah. taught me. Yeah, despite what all that's happened, you're still here today, you're still smiling, mm -hmm. and you're still welcoming everyone. And that's what I heard when I listened to your TED Talk, and it brought tears to my eyes, is after all the heartache, the trauma, the genocide, this is how beautiful mm -hmm. your culture is. You don't want revenge, you just want to be acknowledged, yeah. and that's what I love about you. Thank you. Mwah. Love you, girls. Oh. I love all that you do and all that you stand for, and I'm one of your biggest supporters. Oh, Aww. thank you. And we will do everything that we can to, to educate the masses, mm. to be able to support, support Black Car whatever way we can. If there mm. is going to be an online workshop available for the um, for the public, let me know so we can give it a plug in. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. I know they've yeah. also... No, no, we launched the dates of the public workshops. Yes, remind, yeah. you reminded me. You can go to blackcard.com.au and you can actually now book a, a, a workshop. And I deliver the workshops online. I used to do it face to face. There are three other facilitators, but the online public workshops, I actually uh, deliver those. So, you know, you don't, you don't have to work with an organization that's committed. A lot of people that don't work with, uh, here we go again. If you work with an organization and they haven't began their journey around reconciliation, but you as an individual, uh, you know, are passionate, then that's what these short courses are online is for people that are working in organizations, but the organization doesn't, you know, they don't, they, they don't even know what reconciliation is, right? So reach out to me. I'm even happy. I'm in Brisbane. If you're in Brisbane, go and have a coffee and um, I'd love to, to keep on building relationships with people. And, and, oh, and I, I can it. vouch, you know, I, the, the, when I was part of the Black Card and did the workshops, it changed my life. So anyone out there, oh. highly, highly, highly recommend. It's going to change your life and it's going to open your eyes and, um, mm. and you're going to learn a lot. And I think, it, you know, your workshops really allow us to come together to really um, have us unite as one and be able to learn from each other. But look, thank you so much, Mandanara. It's always an absolute pleasure um, speaking to you, hearing from you. And I just want to thank you so much for coming on and, and, and sharing mm -hmm. your knowledge and wisdom of the elders with us. That was beautiful. And um, mm -hmm. we'll have you on Back again. All right, beautiful. Love you, darling. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Good night.
Thank you, guys. Oh, wow. I just love Mandanara so much, guys. And we're oh. going to give her a plug in. Sorry, um, I went a bit quiet there. I was getting emotional listening to all this. Gosh. Yeah, oh. we've got a long way to go, you know. I think, yeah, we've come, we've come, we've only come so far, but there's so much that we can do in terms of really reconciling. Yeah. Uh, and 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 mm. guys, please, you know, you can get along and do a workshop. Even they actually do their culture tours through Brisbane. So there's so much. Um, but look, I guess that wraps us up for tonight. Next week, we've got Becky Bauer. She's the pastor and founder of the Melbourne Inclusive Church. So she's going to come on. Uh, we're going to have a little bit of a chat, look onto, you know, how the church is coping through COVID. Uh, and she also, it is an, it's, it is an inclusive church. Um, so I'm really excited very to have rare. her. <laughs> which is very, very, very rare to have a church that is inclusive for all our LGBTQI plus community. So I really hope you've enjoyed tonight's show and that you can join us again next week. If you've got any feedback, also, you know, holler at us and let us know what we can do to improve and what guests, topics uh, you'd like on and discuss. Yes. So, guys, have an awesome Hopefully week. And say goodnight. we'll see you next week. <laughs> Bye. Bye. It's all about passion, it's all about change It's all inclusive, every day of the week When the world comes together, united as one Sharing stories with the eyes